Hello and welcome to the highly anticipated Elder Kings 2. If you don't know what Elder Kings is, it is one of the best mods for Crusader Kings 2 and this is the follow up. Both of these mods attempt to change Crusader Kings from being set in the real world to being set in the world of Elder Scrolls, which includes a ton of changes, as you can imagine. Here's a quick rundown of some of the features. It's got a new map, which is roughly two thirds the size of the vanilla map. It's got 10 playable races, which all have their own, you know, 3D modeling and they all have different looks for each member of the race. It's very cool. It's got magic, it's got vampires, it's got new cultures, new religions, new war types, new government types, new succession types. It's got a new system based around uh, birth signs where you get a new trait assigned on birth, which was a feature in the Elder Scrolls games. And it's got so much more in here that I'm very excited to try it out. The magic system in particular looks like it's very fleshed out compared to what I was seeing in Crusader Kings 2. The problem with the Crusader Kings 2 mod is a lot of things in CK2 were kind of bolted on top. Like the DLC was just like, here's a new module, we're going to add a new button for it, and it's just on top, and then there was another one on top, and there's another one on top. And it basically led to this clunky system where you had a button for everything and, and nothing really felt connected. Crusader Kings 3 doesn't really feel that way. Crusader Kings 3 is a game that was built from the ground up to be a little bit easier to deal with, and seeing what they've done with it is very cool. So, I want to jump into the game. Who are we going to play as? We're going to play as Jarl Hackvild up here. And the reason I want to play as him is because I want a simple objective to start. And my simple objective is we're going to get Skyrim for the Nords. And the reason I want that is because I want our objective to be simple so that when we're exploring all these different options for things that we can do, we have a solid goal in mind. So, we're going to play as this guy. Now, you might be asking, when is this set? Because you've got a lot of dates up the top, a lot of different things. What do these actually mean? Well, it's difficult to answer that question because it, there's a lot of conflicting lore in Elder Scrolls. Because effectively, each game adds a new ton of lore on top of the old lore and not all of it matches up. But here's what I could find. So, Elder Scrolls Online, as far as I can tell, is the um, game set the earliest in the Elder Scrolls timeline. And it is set in the year 583 of the Second Era. So that's when the Elder Scrolls Online starts, as far as I can tell. We are in the year uh, 450 of the Second Era. So we're set like 100 odd years before all of that happens. So at the very minimum, we're before all the games by about 100 years. Now, um, there are some other bits with this. I believe, now this is based off some old memory that I have, so whether it's true or not, we can go with it, but anyway. Um, I believe that the original Elder uh, Kings mod was using lore that described this period of time before Elder Scrolls Online came out, which meant that a, when Elder Scrolls Online came out, basically a bunch of the lore got rewritten so that it worked better in an MMO setting. So I don't know what lore they're using. I don't know whether they're using the old stuff they were working off of. I don't know if they're using the Elder Scrolls Online stuff. I don't know if they're using some weird mix of the two or whether they just made it up themselves. So, yeah. But essentially, that's when it's all set. Now, if you want some other dates, just so that you can kind of contextualize some things for you for some of the other games. Um, Elder Scrolls Redguard takes place in the year 864 of the second era, so about 400 years after this point. Uh, then we get into the third era. So the third era uh, ends around the year 900 in the second era, so that means that Elder Scrolls Battle Spire, Elder Scrolls Legends Battle Spire, which I think is the card game, uh, that is about 200, 300 years after Redguard, and that's the year 172 of the third era. I know, it's, it's getting a bit into, you know, the weeds here. Elder Scrolls Arena takes place in the third era in the year 400, so another 200 years after that. Daggerfall is set in the year 405, which is like six years after Arena. And then we get Morrowind, which is set in 427, so 20 years roughly after Daggerfall. And then Oblivion is set in 433. 
So another six years after that. So effectively, what we're looking at is there's about a, a like you know a thousand year gap between the events that are happening here and the events that happen in Oblivion. So that should give you a rough idea of the time scales that we're talking about here, which weirdly doesn't actually um, like take out a lot of the characters from still being around in that time because we still got elves and things that live for a very long time. So some of these characters might be recognizable. Um, but anyway, yes, we're going to be playing as your all Hackfield, who I'm fairly certain won't be around because I'm fairly certain that Nords do not live that long. Anyway. Hackvild is no sheltered prince, having lost his father and birthright almost two decades ago to the Jarl clan. Serving his uncle Engar in Helgen left him ample time to grind his axe into dust and then some. Having succeeded the avuncular throne, he is now chomping at the bit to return the hold to his Nordic hands. Considering he enlisted the support of Whiterun against the marauding orcs and his capital is a solid place from which to attack or retreat to, his dream is within reach. One can never be too careful as the Orzammar are ruthless and fell enemies ready for anything. Will you overcome their defences to chase out Moloch's children or will you watch as Hackvild crashes against orcish might? Well, we'll just have to find out, won't we? So turn off Iron Man there and let's jump in. So the first thing that we're going to see is that there are a few new buttons as well as the new loading screens. There are a few new buttons around the place which basically um, lead to some new mechanics. The main button that you'll probably notice over on the right is this one, the Council of Eight. So the Council of Eight is a new mechanic basically um, showing that the different religions are kind of linked, right? And there's going to be a leader of the Council of Eight. And that, I believe, is based upon whoever has the largest religion, which is a member of the Council of Eight religions, when the leader dies, as far as I'm aware. Although I haven't seen it happen yet, but I, I, I'm sure it will. So you see here we have some different chapels here, and you've got the Imperial Cult, you got Breton Rite, you got Red Guard Creed, and you got the uh, Nord Pantheon. And basically, all of them are different uh, religions, but they're all part of the same uh, Council of Eight faith group, essentially. So um, that's that's something here. And then the Council of Eight has different rules that go with it. Like if you are a member of the Council of Eight, these are things that apply to you. So, for instance, I was talking about leader choice. So um, each chapel takes its turn at being leader of the Council of Eight. A new leader is designated when the head of the faith of the leader dies. Only faiths with an existing head of faith can uh, be chosen as council leader of the Council of Eight, and it's chosen by whoever has the largest faith. So that's that's one new mechanic. I'm assuming that's not going to be too relevant to us immediately, as we're kind of working on a lower level. But you know, it's a new button, so we got to explain what the new button is. You may also notice down in the bottom right, we have this button. So we now have the concept of astronomy. Now astronomy tells you what the active constellation is, a new moon and all sorts of things. Now I believe that this is relevant for the Khajiit down here because they can be born under certain moons, which I believe gives them certain like appearances and may also affect opinion and things. It's kind of a Khajiit thing as far as I'm aware. but. That's why that's there. The constellation is relevant to us. So, if we have a look at our Jarl here, you'll see that he has a new trait. This trait, the ritual. So, just because he's born under a certain birth sign means that he gets a bonus to a stat and he gets a health boost. If we go and have a look at somebody else here, you'll see that um, our daughter was born under the sign of the warrior, so she gets martial. Our son was born under the sign of the tower, so you get stewardship and intrigue. So there's a whole bunch of cool little uh, bonuses that we're going to get. This is going to add flavor to each character. Also, can we talk about our son's stats? They, that is truly an atrocious stat line. It's like just awful. Anyway, um, you'll also see that our son has this thing, Arcana. Now, Arcana, as you might be expecting, leads into spells. Now, uh, let me just check if we have a court mage available. Uh, we did in my test game, but I don't know if we have one here. 
yeah, we have nobody who is eligible to be a court mage. So we're going to have to look at this theoretically rather than actually, but that's okay. So if I just choose this guy at random and open my spell book, um, we can then choose a caster. If we had a court mage, this is where I would put him, uh, but we don't. So uh, let me cancel that. We can then open our spell book and then you can see a lot of new spells that we can cast as well as um, some magicka. So magicka is based off that arcana stat that we have. So points of magicka give you more max magicka and they also give you more monthly generation. You get enough magicka you can then cast a spell if you happen to be able to cast any, which we're not because you have to take a specific lifestyle to then be able to do that. Now, if we have a look in the lifestyle menu, you'll see that there is a new option all the way over here on the right. So, magical arts. Basically, you take the lifestyle if you are able to. Uh, so one of these has to be true. So you have a trait from the student of magical group, uh, your trait of the positive arcana affinity. You already have one of these novice perks or uh, you have arcana of 10 or above. Is, there, is these the same conditions for all of these? Uh, yes, yes. So basically, if you're able to cast magic, you can then go into these things. You can get this stuff, which then gets you the uh, ability to cast spells and rituals. And basically, it allows you to do a bunch of cool little extra things. We currently have nobody who can cast spells, so maybe that's something that we should try and find early on. We should try and find somebody who can cast spells for us, because they sound like they could be useful. Now, if you're also looking around going, Oh, what are all these new bits? What does that mean? What does that mean? You probably noticed this. Choose a patron. Now, this is part of our religion. So we have an e a couple of extra bits on our religion here. First of all, Council of Eight Member. So, uh, doctrine changes made by the leader will trickle down to this faith. So basically, if you're a member of the Council of Eight, all of the different um, members of the Council of Eight get things that happen from the leader. So if you're the leader, you can start making changes for a large variety of people. You also get the ability to um, have a pantheon of gods. Uh, because we are Nordic, we get the Nordic pantheon. I believe these are just renamed gods and like the other gods match up pretty much one to one to this Nordic pantheon. But if we keep scrolling down, we've got some new laws in here, lycanthropy and vampirism and uh, necromancy. Interestingly, necromancy we have a pragmatic uh, view on, so they're only shunned, but, you know, not necessarily completely against it. Unlike, you know, if you turn into a werewolf, that's straight not allowed. If we keep scrolling, you can see we've got some other stuff. So you got Daedric Doctrines. So I believe that, I'm going to put this very simply and it's not correct, but you get the idea. Basically, in Elder Scrolls, there's like a list of good gods and a list of bad gods. Um, good gods are going to be like this list up here, uh, essentially. And then the bad gods are these guys down here. And then, effectively, this is how worship of them is viewed within our land. So it's a new thing added in here. So you'll see that most of them are a criminal thing, and generally due to what you have to do to be a worshipper of one of these people. But we have one which is just shunned. So... That's fine. And then we have our Virtues and Sins, which are mostly the same as the base game, except that they've got different pictures. Um, but anyway, as part of our religion, we have a new thing. So Fervor has a Fervor Equilibrium. So instead of your Fervor just being constantly high, I believe this is going to be similar to Dread in the base game, where basically you have a value for it and it's going to trend down towards that value or trend up towards that value based upon this equation that you can see on the screen here. Um, so that, that's kind of new. But you also have patrons. So we can choose to have a patron god. So this is kind of like our favorite of the pantheon. And these all give us a benefit. If I click here, actually, we can get rid of uh, the lore and instead get, here's what they give us. So there's a whole bunch of different bonuses here, like stewardship, intrigue, I'm going to leave it for just now. We're going to come back to this. But once we have an idea of what we're doing, this is going to be our first place to go to say, okay, what bonuses can I get towards that? 
Right, um, I think we've gone through most of the new stuff. Is there something new in here? I don't believe so. No, I think that there are some traits that are slightly different, but um, nothing too exciting. I think we might actually be ready to uh, start somewhere. Oh, that's something I haven't seen. Alchemy is a fascination. Oh, it just gives like a health boost. Okay, that well, wasn't nearly as exciting as I was hoping for. But anyway, yes, um, we control Falkreath. Falkreath, this little bit of land here. And our goal is to get our claim, the kingdom of Falkreath, which is currently owned by this orc. Now, our goal is fairly simple. We want to raise up our men here and defeat the orc. We currently do not have enough men. How many men does our ally have? Our ally has 3,000. So, what we're looking at here is our 900 plus our ally's 3,000 versus the orc's 3,500. If we can win that, we get all this land and suddenly we're in a great position. If we don't win that, oh, well, uh, things get less good for us. So, let's see what we can do to improve our station immediately before we declare the war. Um... Our heir is unmarried, and we are unmarried, so we can potentially get another couple of alliances here somewhere. Um, let me just have a quick look around. Are these guys all... So these guys are all Nordic over here, so chances are we could probably get an alliance with one of them. Potentially somewhere. You have a couple of siblings who are unmarried. Seems like that would work pretty well. Yeah, so someone like that would be good to get a few extra troops, because every extra troop is going to help. Anything else that we need to do? Lifestyle is probably important. Uh, we can challenge criminals to trial by combat. I'd rather not, to be honest. We can feudalize Orphan Rock. Uh, is that one of the bits of land that we hold directly then? Yes, it's currently giving us absolutely nothing. How much does it cost to feudalize it? Uh, let me have a look here. Uh, you should reform the holding, making it a castle. Ah, this button. That'll be the one I'm looking for. Does it do anything? I don't remember whether this costs money. Yes, it does. It costs 500 gold, which we do not have. Well, in which case, I'm going to accept the five troops that I get from it, being our only reward, and move on with my life. Right. Um, let's have a look at our lifestyle tree here. So we've gone very far down the learning tree. So we've got uh, our wards can gain additional skills. We, we don't have any. Uh, different culture opinion bonuses, uh, different faith opinion bonuses, cultural fascination progress doesn't matter because we're not the culture leader, so I don't believe it matters um, whether we have a bonus to this or not, it would only matter if we were the culture leader. Uh, increased development in county efficiency, we're probably not going to do that immediately because we're looking to go to war. Uh, learning per level of devotion doesn't matter. Counselor skills added to your own is interesting. That potentially means if we can get some good counselors, we can increase our skills fairly easily. Something to look at. And we can use the buy claim interaction. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. I don't even know if we could. And then we can maybe get Scholar. I don't see a great reason to do that. The fact that we get Arcana is nice, so potentially we could become a spellcaster. Although, even with an extra 5 arcana, we're still below the 10 that we need to actually start getting into spellcasting. So, I don't think learning is the right path for us. I think that we're probably past the point to do learning. What about this? Well, if we look in uh, Marshall, we've actually got new stuff in here. I didn't know there was new stuff. You see, I was saying this earlier that there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that I haven't found yet. It's basically, have I opened the right menu to find new stuff? No. But there's a whole bunch of new stuff about raiding, and it unlocks the ability to raid if you just go into here. Now that's interesting. That's probably something to think about after a war, but I like it. Uh, we've got bonuses to us leading armies and knight effectiveness. So if we can get some good knights, that would be good. And also, uh, if we raise our... I guess if we raise uh, our marshal as well, we'll probably be a better leader. Marshal and prowess. Yeah, okay, that's something to think about. Uh, what, have we got any new one, other ones in here? So there's nothing new in there. Is, it, is the new one only in Marshall? Uh, I think it probably is. Yes. So there is only one new one. Explains how I missed it. Anyway, uh, so I think Marshall's probably a good place for us to go. Yeah, if we take an advantage bonus, that'd be good. Let me just raise our army and have a look. So I don't really want to raise our army. I just want to look at the commander screen. So currently we are our best commander by a significant margin. 
at 24. So we should probably um, work on the assumption that we're going to be commanding our armies. So maybe if I choose the chivalry focus, gives us more prowess, gives us more advantage. So we'll be even better leading armies. That seems like a good idea to me. So, good first start. Uh, anything else in here? We can hire a court mage. No, we can't. We have nobody who's eligible. Uh, we can hire a court physician. We could. Um, court priest headache would probably do fine. I appoint you to the job. Seems like a good thing if we're about to go to war. We need to set up our council. Is this our best possible council? Probably not, because our marshal has three marshal. Um, we could replace our marshal with Bori. Now, you are a powerful vassal, so we do, in theory, want you to be doing a job. Just probably not that job. You could be our spy master. I mean, you're not good at it, but you are better than Lendman Yor Yorn. What's Lendman Yorn good at? He's good at um, chancellorship. Okay. So he's better than our chancellor. What's our chancellor good at? Our chancellor's good at intrigue. Well, you can do intrigue. What are you good at? You're good at nothing. You only have 37 troops. You're not powerful. Let's get rid of you. Repl replace you with uh, Bori. Bori's going to run this job. Actually, we could potentially replace it with our daughter as well. Although she's our steward. <laughs> Alright, I replace you with Bori. Yes, that's fine. Um, I'm then going to swap my Chancellor and uh, Spy Master, because this seems like a very sensible thing to do. Yes, because they're better at each other's jobs. There we go. So all of this is increasing our stats as well. Are you my best steward? You are. Okay. Well, good job, player air. Uh, we'll leave everything where it is for just now. We should have more troops than we had previously as well, because we have a new Marshal who has more stats. And our Marshal stat is now much better as well, because of learn on the job, we get an extra plus two there. Which increases our levy size even more. All of that seems good. Right, I think we need to get some marriages going. Uh, let's get our Jarl and see who we can marry. So we saw in Winterhold that you've got a couple of unmarried siblings. Could we potentially marry one of them? Also, you're the heir. Can we marry? Could we just marry you non-matrilineally? No. Absolutely not. That, that would not be allowed. Okay. My cult... Wait, that was my culture differs was a big negative there. Interesting. Okay. What about you? What if I wanted to marry you? Minus four. Now, minus four is interesting. We could maybe do... We can do something with a minus four. Um, if I send a gift, maybe we could do something. Um, can I send a gift? How much is a gift? Mm, it's about three times the amount of gold that I have. Alright, well, um, we can't send a gift. I don't think there's anything we can do to make that more likely. Okay, we just have to live with that. Uh, let's continue looking around, see if we can find anybody nearby. Now, you have a bunch of daughters. Are any of them unmarried? Yes. Princess uh, Birdgrid is unmarried here. That seems good. Yeah, potentially we can get an alliance with Eastern Skyrim there. That's 4,600 troops. That would be a good alliance. Let's see if you will accept a marriage. No, you have absolutely no interest because they're marrying down. Oh, right, what level title are you? Uh, you're, high, you're the High Queen. So you're actually an Empire to your title. That's why she's so against it. Okay. Uh, do you have a kingdom underneath you? Uh, no. You have a bunch of dukes underneath you. None are particularly powerful. Okay, cool. I'll leave you alone. How about the rift over here? You're 1,700. I, I suppose, actually, you know, an easier way of doing this, instead of clicking on absolutely everybody on the map, why not just do this and then just click alliance power? Let's see what it says. So, potentially, I could ally with the um, Imperial Guard. Now, they, they seem pretty far away to me, and yeah, this does, doesn't really seem like the right thing to be doing. So let's maybe not go with them. How about you? Dawnstar. So you got uh, 1,500 troops. That doesn't seem too bad. We'd be marrying who here? So I'm, I'm still struggling to see what relation you are to him. Are you his aunt? Yes, I, I, I think you are. Uh, yes. Okay, we could do that. Doesn't potentially get us anything that we can use, but maybe we could press a claim. Yeah, we, we could potentially press a claim, do something with that. Doesn't seem bad. 
yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I think this marriage is fine. Especially as we already have two children. We're not necessarily looking for more. This is a solid marriage for this character. So, we will send the proposal. Next up, we're going to have a look at our daughter. Now, we're going to find her somebody to marry. Same thing, we're using matrilineal. Look for alliance power, and we'll just have a look around. Homestead, that's even further away than uh, the one that was here that I just skipped over the top of. How about you? Even further away. You? A little bit closer, but still pretty far away. Rorikstead. Aha! Uh -huh. So you have a thousand troops. You are right next to us, so you'd be perfect for this. Uh, you're 20. You don't have any positive uh, traits, but you know what? Right now, I think I'm more interested in getting the land than getting traits. So let's go with that. Also, one thing I should double check is what's our succession law? Autocracy. Okay. Um, vassal obligations are tied to this. Blah, 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 blah. That's our government type, not our succession law. Um, equal partition. Okay. So our land will split upon succession. So we need to be aware of that because um, we need to get the entire kingdom before this character dies. Otherwise, uh, Falkreath here might split up a little bit. Unless, we do we hold one duchy title or two? We hold two duchy titles, yeah. So we need to get this kingdom before our character dies. Or, uh, these two duchies will split off from one another and they'll go to each of these children. You see, he's, he will get the hold of Helgen. And we will get the hold of Falkreath, which is obviously not ideal. We would prefer to have it all. Right, so we're doing that. Um, is there any way of changing the succession law? There are some new ones. Rule by Might. What's this one? Um, under Rule by Might succession, the strongest child can inherit. Children might push their claim before the ruler's death if they feel strong enough. Why can we not do that? Does not have active name. Okay, cool. Uh, guessing we don't have the culture thing for it. Or maybe you can only do it if you're a certain something. I don't know. I, I do like a uh, pirate share. What does this mean? Under pirate share succession, each county will decide if they follow your heir or if they decide their own course. Uh, that sounds horrifying. <laughs> Every single county gets a choice. Uh, I'd rather not. Mystical birthright. A successor will be chosen by the current head, head of faith. All right, let's that, just roll the dice. Okay, so there's some interesting stuff in here. Um, I think we'll stick with Partition, given the current options available, given that's our only option available. Interesting. Right. Uh, let's choose a patron. Uh, effects only. And I think I saw, yeah, so there's a prowess one here that's probably going to be where we go. Movement speed 10%, though, is quite nice. Maybe we'll go with uh, Keen. Who is Keen? Goddess of the uh, Storm, Widow of Shore, and Favored God of Warriors. Sounds like a good choice. She is often called the mother of men. Her daughters taught the first Nords to use the Thum, or a storm voice. Let's do it. I am now a follower of Keen, which gives us that trait as well. Can I look around? Does anyone else have a trait yet? Well, of, well you're an orc. You probably have your own stuff going on. Nobody else does, but I'm assuming that they will when the game starts. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so we have a couple of alliances going there. Just trying to think if there's anything else we want to do before we, like, go. We're marrying off our daughter. I think we're good. I think we wait for the marriages to come through and then we just declare war. My alliance expired? What? What did my alliance expire with you? Well, I don't even know why I had an alliance with you, to be honest, but it's expired. Well, that's not good. How do I get it back? Um... I cancel the betrothal immediately and betroth my daughter to him. Well, that doesn't help because he'd say no. Okay. Well, th that's less than ideal. Well, at least we formed an alliance with you, Rorikstead. So that's an extra 1,000 troops on our side. Okay, so we're now like at 2,000 troops. Um, You? It's an extra 1,600, which puts us at about... 3,600. Almost exactly the amount he has once we get an extra 200 troops from the amount that we raised from raising our marshal. Okay. Wedding celebration. 
With my marriage to Lady Lydia, the realm expects us to throw a suitably extravagant wedding celebration. It is well within my right to collect a royal aid duty as part of this, but some may consider it tasteless to levy an extra tax during a time of jubilation. Um, yes, it is tasteless, but I need it for the war. Wedding feast. And with the blessings of Debella, I now declare Hackvild and Lydia to be newlyweds. The crowd cheered and made a line to congratulate both me and Lydia in our new adventure. After that, the crowd started packing up and making plans of the bot tree for a great feast was given in honor of our newly placed arrows to the knee, as it was customary. Okay, um, didn't expect to see the arrows uh, to the knee meme already, but sure, why not? New Life Festival. Guests are gathered around the New Life Tree lords and ladies from the near and far reaches of the realm. The mood is bright and spirits are high as the New Life Festival begins. Where apparently it's festival season. I was not aware. Feast in my house. I ate everything I could ensuring that Astrid and Lady Lydia would be as far from each other as possible, but it was not enough. And now they have come to blows in the middle of my feast, so this is my player heir and my new wife. Okay, well, we can throw Lydia out to cool off or restrain Astrid until things uh, calm down. I don't really want to be rivals with either, but I guess I would rather be a rival with my player heir because um, I would like my wife to not kill me. New heir? What? I've un... Whoa, whoa, okay, I've uncovered the truth. The cold-blooded witch behind my daughter Astrid's early demise was none other than my wife, Lady Lydia. What, what are you doing? Okay, you killed her already. Oh, she thought she would get away with such a heinous crime, but mark my words, Lady will pay dearly for her sins. What is going on? We've been here about 10 seconds. As I stumble outside to relieve myself, I hear shouting around the corner. As I turn, I see my wife, Lady Lydia, sneer at, uh, sneer as she sinks her blade into the face of the uh, cowering Astrid. Whatever sound I uh, made must have been enough, for Lydia turns towards me, surprise in her face. Um. Obviously, I'm going to reveal the secret. You just killed my. You just killed my daughter. Jarl Hackfield of Falkreath has exposed a most gruesome secret. My daughter Astrid met her early death at the hands of my wife, Lady Lydia. A hysterical witch better sleep with one eye open. In one way or another, she will come to regret this bitterly, I swear it, on Astrid's grave. I, I, I guess we'll imprison her. Outliving a child. Astrid has been murdered. Oh, yes, I, I, I am aware. Um, we've been told many times. Oh, kin, how could you do this to Astrid? If I have sinned, why did you not punish me instead? So she's dead. And my guests have left the feast. Okay. Well, um, on that bombshell, I think I'm going to end the episode there. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the first episode of the series, please consider liking, commenting, subscribing, all that sort of stuff that everybody tells you to do, because it really helps on the first episode of a video, and it helps with search ranking and all that sort of stuff. So, thank you for watching, and I will see you tomorrow for another episode of Elder Kings. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.